In a sea of realtors all vying for attention, it's easy to fall into the trap of marketing to everyone. But here's the hard truth. When you try to speak to everyone, you end up speaking to no one. Now this not only dilutes your message, but it also makes it harder to stand out in what I call the bloody ocean of competition. But imagine if you could cut through that noise and speak directly to the heart of your dream clients. That's where the concept of an ideal client avatar comes into play. It's not just a buzzword. It's a powerful tool that allows you to tailor your messaging services and even your personal brand to attract the clients that you most want to work with. So today we're going to dive into how to define your ideal client avatar. Let's get into it. Welcome to the influential real estate marketing podcast. I'm Amber Joy, once a struggling agent, now a referral powerhouse. I've been where you are, overwhelmed by countless marketing strategies and stuck in analysis paralysis. Alongside my husband and fellow coach, Jason, we've discovered what truly works in today's real estate market. Our mission is to guide you through the clutter of old school tactics to the clarity of modern, effective marketing that elevates your influence and your referrals in your local market. Join us and our remarkable guests as we share the blueprint for success that's working right now. Let's dive in. Hey, 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 welcome, Jason. We're excited to have you on this episode because you, my friend, are a a little bit more than friend, actually. But <laughs> I was going to say, wow. You are an, an expert in uh, social media marketing and really mm. just a, having an overall plan to attract your ideal client anyway. So that gets me real excited about you being here today. Well, I appreciate being here. I love it. I like when I'm here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, I like what you were saying because most agents, they don't do this. And so the question I'm always asking is how do you develop a marketing or a networking strategy if you really haven't established who you're trying to attract? Mm, that's good. It's kind of like the navigation, right? In the car. <laughs> well, yeah, because it's, you, you, you tend to fall victim to trying a ton of things. Like if you don't know, well, I back up. If you don't know who you are and you don't know who your audience is, I always tell agents those are really the, the two components that you kind of need to figure out because once you do, then anything that gets thrown at you, be it an idea or something you see at a conference, becomes very crystal clear or very easy to discern, hey, I can use this in my business or I can't use my business, if you know those two things. Um, so if you don't understand your audience, then then any marketing will look good. Any time you see an agent uh, you know, on a panel talking about this really cool, exciting thing, you start to get excited about, oh, I could totally use that. But if you if you truly knew who you're targeting, there would be some ideas you're like, that's, that's not going to work for me. Yeah. Well, Jason, I think that some agents are... A lot of agents just don't know that they're supposed to do this, or maybe they haven't been taught that they need to establish this. Um, but I also think another reason agents don't do this, take the time to really establish who is my ideal client avatar, is because they're scared that if they do, that it's going to alienate everyone else and that their sales will actually go down if they do this. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I I don't understand where that comes from. I th I mean, I, I kind of do that if I'm marketing to this, you know, it, I'll take veterans, for example. I'm going to market to Army veterans. Um, if I start marketing Army veterans, then I'm not going to be able to work with anybody else. And that's not, that's not, there's two separate things. Who you're marketing to versus who you're going to do business with are, are two vastly different things. Um, marketing has to be specific. You have to call out your people. Um, does that mean that you'll get only those people? No, you'll, you'll get people that are attracted to what you're doing regardless. Um, you're going to resonate with people more. Um, it, it, it reminds me of, of agents not wanting to put their office on their business card because they were afraid people would think that they wouldn't be able to help them if they lived in a different city. 
um, it's that same kind of mentality. It's like, oh, I don't want to have this on my business card because they'll read it and go, oh, you can't help me. Uh, you're in Dallas and I live in Frisco. And it's just not the way people's brains are wired psychologically. So it's just, it's always it was a little bit weird to me, but it's absolutely not the case that your marketing can be specific. But again, the people that you decide to work with are, are it's not even the same ballpark. So it's hard for me to wrap my head around. Well, and you you hope that when you are establishing your ideal client avatar, that those are the people you're working with. That's the whole point of you doing well, yeah, the exercise. Yeah, that's the whole point of doing. Yeah, absolutely. But it doesn't mean you're alienating everybody that's not in that list. Ultimately, that's going to be your decision. Um, well, I, I know, you know that it reminds me of it reminds me of when we ask agents who is their ideal client, and instead of answering that question, they start to tell us about the people they've worked with in the past. You know, that like those two are combined and for whatever reason, it's like, that's not what I asked you as who is your ideal client? Well, let me tell you about the people I worked in the past. It's like, well, you're, you're coming to me because you don't want to work with, you know, you want to go up in price point or you want to, you know, have a certain <laughs> demographic. So why are you telling me about the past people that makes, that's got no bearing on what we're going to be going after? Unless that is your ideal client, right? Has every past right. sale been your ideal client? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Or also saying who uh, it's common for you, Jason, I've heard it before on your calls where you, you will say, hey, before we go into the strategy of how you're going to attract this client online, who is your ideal client? Yeah. And a common answer you get is and anyone, a buyer uh, or seller. Anyone buying or selling a home. I'm like, that's, that's not true. It's just, it's, it's not that's true. a scary answer. Well, it's, it's such a scary answer because number one, it tells me that, hey, you don't really have a plan to market yourself. And because I would always say this, I remember I would, I would, when I was teaching classes, I would do this, you know, Hey, who's, who's looking to, for a buyer and seller lead and everybody raises their hands. I'm like, all right, cool. I've got a, you know, a mobile home buyer about two and a half hours away who wants it. Like no one would raise their hands. And like, then, then what you just said is not true. You know, looking for anyone buying or selling, you would not take someone looking to buy a mobile home. That's three and a half hours away from you. You wouldn't do it. If you did, then we need to talk. Or if you would, then we need to definitely have a serious conversation about that. So you're not trying to attract just anybody. Mm. Not to say you won't work with buyers and sellers, but that's not who you're trying to attract. Those are two right. different things, which leads me into the story of how the ideal client avatar kind of became real to me. Yeah. I mean, years ago, um, I had somebody working for me that had extremely curly hair. Okay. And if you're in the audience and you happen to have naturally really curly hair, you know how important it is for somebody to cut your hair that is familiar with curly hair. Right? And so I thought about this. She told me that there was a salon she wanted to go to that cut uh, curly hair only. They were a curly hair salon. That's what they specialized in. That was their ideal client. Mm -hmm. And they were, it took her like a couple months just to get an appointment because they had a wait list and they charged more than any other place. And when she went there and she came back and I, I know how excited she was for that appointment, I asked her, so what did you think? Did you love it? Your hair looks great. And she's like, it was the most expensive hair trip I've ever had at a salon. <laughs> nice. And she said, and I'll, I'm going back. I loved it. My hair looks great. They sold me all these products that work great in my hair. And so even though it was the most expensive haircut she'd ever gotten, she couldn't wait to go back. Loved it. Loved how she was catered to based on her exact style of hair. And it really got me to thinking how we, including myself, let's say as agents, our mindset, put it in the context of this story. Let's say me and another gal decided to open a hair salon and they said something like, hey, we're only going to accept people with curly hair at the salon. I might have been guilty of saying, well, I don't want to do that because even though, yes, I want a special, I, I like curly hair people. I don't want to alienate or lose the business of the people that don't happen to have curly hair. That at the time might've been my limiting mindset, right? When in reality, by being polarized about who your ideal client is, these people separated themselves from the, what I call the bloody ocean, and they have a wait list and can charge more than any of the other salons by being polarizing about what they specialize in versus all the other salons that might have been scared to to take that stance but they're competing against hundreds of other salons just in one city so that 
that story just resonated with me because we might initially get scared to to really pick that person but by doing so you're taking yourself out of the competition and separating yourself from the pack and putting yourself in a position of power and i just think that that is so cool it's, it's, it's super cool and, and listen to that story it, because you're super right. cool. I think when, when, when we hear, I only want to market to the word only just jacks with people. Um, because in their heads only is going to go, Oh, then I'm not doing, I'm, I'm not marketing someone else. Yeah, you're right. You're not, but it doesn't mean you're not going to get it. Like I only want to market to gated community golf course people. Perfect. Does that mean you're only going to get that? No. That just means that your focused effort in in doing that is going to lead to more business there, and it will bleed over. You know. Yeah, because what you focus on expands, but that doesn't right. mean you won't have other people that are attracted to work with you. But now you've separated yourself from the pack because you're the only one saying that. And psychologically, so, if I see you as an expert, like if you're super super good, and I'll, I'll go back to to veterans because I started with that. If you're super good at working with veterans, but not just any veteran, but army of veterans, you speak the language, you know the talk. But if I, you know, if I like that about you and I, I see you as an expert, like this person, man, knows this, like back of my hand, I will then interpret that, uh, the specialty or the expertise to bleed into other areas. You know, like, hey, I'm a veteran, but I was I was in the Navy. I'm not going to go, oh, well, you can't help me because you're a veteran for Army people. I never hear you talk about the Navy. <laughs> right. You're going to go, man, you understand veterans, and so I want to work with you. Or then you have yeah. someone else a little bit further away. It's like, man, I really appreciate you helping out, you know, people who are in the service and giving back because my uncle is in the service. And, man, I, I really – and I'd love to work with you. That's, that's where you kind of have to take a look at it from a different perspective versus, man, you're shutting everybody out. No, you're, you're specializing in something and truly setting yourself apart. Yeah, I love it. So as if that's not a good enough reason, setting yourself apart, which should be a good enough reason because there's so many realtors and you should be setting yourself apart. It's also going to help you to market better, mm -hmm. like we were talking about earlier, in a more clear yeah. message and you're going to attract people. Let's also talk about how it's going to help you to like what you do a whole lot better, right? Because with your sphere of influence, which you guys know is our number one sphere is always number one. Yeah. They're all over the place, right? It could be cousins, past coworkers, people you went to school, and they're all over the city, all over the gamut when it comes to personalities, ages, areas, and you can't help who you start with. But what you want to do is grow that list from then on with your mm -hmm. ideal client avatar. And how do you do that if you don't know who your ideal client avatar is? So the point of this podcast is to get you to see the importance of one, but also we're going to take you through an exercise right now on how to determine who your ideal client avatar is. So I want to encourage you to get out a piece of paper or get out the notes app on your phone and take a few notes on um, the following questions that you can ask yourself. And by the end of this lesson or this podcast, you will understand uh, what exercise you need to take yourself through to have a very clear definition of who your ideal client avatar is. Just don't do it so, while you're driving. Yeah, don't do it. Wait. Trying. Wait. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. All right, so let's go through the exercise. Now, the first four questions are going to be grouped together. Um, let's see here. Uh, the first question I want you to ask yourself is, who are the people that you have worked with in the past that you loved working with? So not all of them, who are all of them? No, instead, who are the ones that come top of mind that you loved working with in the past? And I want you to actually list their names out, okay? Because I'm sure you just take a minute to think about those. If you need to, you might have to go to your past sales or you might have to go to the MLS where your save searches are to kind of jog your memory. But think about, you probably will have it right inside your mind if they're your favorite people. They probably became yeah. like family to you or close friends. Who are those people? And I want you to write those out. Now, there is a method to the madness and we'll get there. You just got to trust us and go step by trust step with process. us. And that's going to be, yeah, trust the process. That is question number one. All right. So uh, I'll take question number two. So question number two 
is what geographical area do you most like to work in? And to go into a little bit more detail on this, geographical area, um, it's it should be a little bit small. Now, small, I mean, as compared to big. So let me give you an example. We're here in the North Dallas area. Whenever we've done this exercise, I'll have agents like, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. I'm like, okay, let's let's pause. Do you, you know, and, and this person could live in, you know, North Dallas. I'm like, all right, for, Fort Worth is over an hour away from where you're at on a good day. And so what you're telling me is that you're going to drive over an hour to go help someone at a price point that you could probably get in less than five minutes of where you're at. And so I just want to go in geographical area. It's got to have some rules to it. Um, now, I don't know how you feel about the rule. For me, it's about a, a 30 minute drive in any direction. Um, because you know, remember, this is where we re remind people. This doesn't mean you won't take people outside that area. Correct. It means ideal, ideal, ideal. Yeah, ideal. So not just I won't do it. The more focused you can get with this, the better. So, and and, and do and for me, it's a math thing. Like if you are going to cover, you know, two hundred square miles, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a big area. And, and you, it, so just really need to start. I like to uh, suggest maybe you start either where you live or where you work and then kind of do a radius around that that's not too far away. Because it, 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 I mean, there are some cities that have over 400 different subdivisions ranging in price from, you know, low 200s to well over 2 million. And so you really don't have to go that far. Far. We're just used to going that far. So the second question that you guys want to write down is what geographical area do you most like to work in? In a dream world. In a dream world. Not that you won't go outside of that area, but who exactly in a dream world would you be trying to attract what geographical area? <laughs> dream yeah. world. It's hard to do that. We want to go back into the realism when we're doing it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The third question is... What type of transactions do you most enjoy working on? So um, this, just an example of this would be, uh, is it buyers? Is it listings? Is it people uh, maybe who are first time home buyers? Maybe those transactions were all people buying investment properties or, and I'm not, again, it doesn't mean that's what you've done all uh, done in the past. It means which ones do you enjoy the most? You may have only done one of them in the past, but you liked it the most. Okay. So what type of transactions do you most enjoy working on? It might be a move up person, you know, where they list and then buy higher. It might be somebody who is um, retiring and they want to have a smaller place. Like, it, you know, the sky's the limit. What type of transactions do you most enjoy on enjoy working on? And your veteran example comes back in too, because yeah. that might be the type of transaction as well. Yeah, and this almost kind of bleeds into the, the 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 next question is what do you want to be known for? And to me, that's about legacy. You know, what do you want to be known for? Um, to to go on to that, the, I love working. You know, on on you know the veterans and the VA loans and all that stuff. Um, and help them out manage and navigate that process. So again, maybe you want to be known for the agent who does a really good job at helping veterans or whatever. Um, what do you want to be known for? Uh, is is again, it's it's not. It's just pulling your focus uh, into marketing. And again, all, we're talking about the marketing aspect of it, not who you're willing to work with. So what do you want to be known for? And and uh, to me, it can't be like, well, I want to be known as a, a realtor who treats everyone like family. Is it? No, that's. That's not that's, the same thing. You want to do that thing. no matter what the answer is. Yeah, Correct. exactly. Correct. I like that distinction. So, okay. You now have questions one through four. So yeah. I realize that you may not have had time to go through this exercise right now, but you, hopefully you've had time to write these down. So after the podcast, you can go through and, and really take some time to give purposeful answers. And what we want you to do is take a look at what you wrote down for answers one through four and start to circle or write down what did all of those things have in common? Because if you really were thoughtful about one through four, who were the people you liked working with in the past? 
what geographical area do you like? Was there a certain type of transaction and what do you want to be known for? I want you to see if any of those had things in common. Okay, because that will start to also point you in a certain direction before we move on to the next questions. And then I think the next question after you've taken time to do that, I think these numbers are a little off, Jay, so we'll pay attention there. <laughs> no, that's <fine>. Is <laughs> um, next, we're going to take a look at the next set of questions. Okay. And number five, what price range do you most enjoy working in? Okay. Price range does not mean commission price range of homes. Okay. Mm. Or price range of the transaction. <laughs> that is going to be the next question. There's no right or wrong here. This is what, because believe it or not, um, I've had people that go through this exercise, Jason, and then they'll be in the audience if we're doing it in person. They're like, well, duh, it was $2 billion. Actually, right. a lot people, including myself, don't love working high, high dollar. It stays on the market a lot longer. Uh, I love luxury listings, don't get me wrong, but don't assume that just because it's a $5 million house, that that's, that person loves working that. Not necessarily. Not always. But also, but also range is something that needs to be thought more about because if you say, well, my price range is from 300000 and up, and oh yeah, can't do that. Can't Why can't do they do because, that? Because well, the a three hundred thousand dollar buyer is not the same as a million dollar buyer. In fact, you probably skipped over two to three different types of buyers in that. So, if ever you look at your answers and you're struggling to figure out how to market, typically it means that your range is too large, and so you're pulling in different types of people. Someone buying a three hundred dollar buy house is not the same person buying an eight hundred. That's they're not the same person. They don't have the same jobs. They don't have the same interests. And so, if you make your ranges and any range that we ask you to say, hey, give a range between this, um, you just really need to keep that in mind that the range needs to be. And I would say for for prices, I think two hundred or maybe three hundred k is be like the max price range because you're really getting into different types of people. At like I would even say the three hundred. I like to go conservative and say. You know, if you said five to seven within a two hundred thousand dollar range, that could be the same person. Um, much Except for when you that. start getting to luxury. When you start oh, getting yeah. to luxury, so for example, RJ's is eight hundred to, you know, one point two million. Yeah. Okay, because we're still staying in a small area that has all that price range. But when you're right. If, if you're in a lower price bracket, that range should be very small because those are very different buyers that buy a 300 and 500 even. Even with only yeah, a $200,000 difference, that's a massive difference in the kind of client it's going to be. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Good call. Right, thank you for reminding me about that. No, that's okay. <laughs> so what's the next question they should ask um, themselves? Kind of goes along with, with, the, with the range. What is your ideal client's age range? Uh, and again, and I'm, we're probably have to say this at least 57 more times, it's not about who you're willing to work with, it's about who you're marketing to. Because depending upon your age range, you're going to use different graphics, you're going to use different words, you're going to use different, you know, slang, you're going to use... They different, have different I mean, challenges. Different challenges, different ideals, like everything changes based upon age, you know, like boomers, mm -hmm. Gen X, Gen Z, you know... Malik. There's so They're many gens different. now. I can't even keep up. <laughs> you know, and and so and so these are needs to be things to think about. And, and you don't have to pick something in like close to your age range. Um, this is something that you had. Like you were when you came in, you were incredibly young, and you thought that you had to look older than you were for credibility. But it actually, ended up not being the case. Well, I think it helped that I dressed a lot better than I do now back then. <laughs> Now I can be a little more casual because I have 22 years experience back then. I felt like, you know, I really, although I wouldn't go to a listing appointment looking like I am right now. Um, but um, it, another thing I want to point out here, Jason, about this one age range, it's very important that I say this, is this is not about discrimination. 
Mm. Okay. So none of these that we're about to go over, including the next two are about discriminating against any group. We're not allowed to do that, obviously. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, this isn't about discrimination. This is just about, Hey, this just happens to be the age that relates to me most, regardless of my age, or that I enjoy helping the most based on my personality or my talents or my past experience. Yeah. This will never be about discrimination because we will never not help someone based on their age, of course. No, this is simply, and again, I know we're going to say this over and over again throughout this whole thing is like, this is about focusing on how to market. Yes. All right. The next one is what is your ideal client's values? Mm, most, most people never think about that one. No, they don't. So can you go into a little more detail about this as far as what, what that means? I think when you start to think about some of like the question number one was who were the past clients you enjoyed working with the most, they probably had an age range in common. They probably had values that were in common because our values, you know, have you ever heard that saying your vibe will attract your tribe? Mm. And so you, you probably, your values will probably closely align with the values of the people that you most enjoy working with. So what does that look like? Again, not discriminating against people, but what does that look like ideally for you? Somebody's values, are they somebody who uh, values integrity over anything else? Are they somebody who uh, doesn't mind paying for commissions because they just want, they value their time more than they do money because time is money. You know, it could be a lot of, it could look like a lot of different things. And I can't say what your values are or what, what you should do, but that is an important question. I think you should address. I like it. And it kind of goes like with it. the next one, Jason. Yeah. I was going to say, it's very similar. The next question that you guys want to answer uh, to figure out who your, your ideal client is, is what is your ideal client's personality? And, you know, it, it, like you were saying, you want to resonate, uh, you know, I, you want to resonate at the same frequency as someone else because you just tend to get along better. If you are a bit uh, on the introverted side, do you want to work with someone who's incredibly over the top and super outgoing? Um, you know, if you're, it, yeah, I might just like, you're a little bit much for me. And and that's okay. And again, we're, we're looking at who we need to market to. I think about it affects on how you're presenting or how you're talking. I, again, my brain automatically goes to the verbiage or the vernacular that you're using with certain people. If their personality is, if you're going after personalities like yours, then that's what you'll get. I, I love, I think it was, they say that you don't, attract the people that you want you attract the people that are the closest to who you are of who you, you are know. yeah yeah and and this goes to the case of we interviewed somebody recently that has a lot of business from TikTok, and their personality style and their videos kind of are smart aleck fun well those are the kind of people she's attracting okay so when you go to make content or establish a marketing plan you're going to establish it based around the kind of people you're trying to attract. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it's important. You're looking, is that who I'm trying to attract? Right. Do I like working with that person? Because they're fun. But when I actually went to work on a transaction with them, was it fun? Those are all things you want to be thinking about. Um, and the next one, and I, I do believe this is the last one for this particular exercise is, uh, what is your ideal client's lifestyle look like? Um, maybe that's, uh, these are young parents. Maybe that's somebody who's very active in the golf course community. Maybe this is somebody who loves horses and they're equestrians. Again, doesn't mean we have to say this on like all of them. So we don't get in trouble. It doesn't mean you won't help people outside of that lifestyle. It means that's the lifestyle you're trying to attract because you feel like you have a lot of knowledge there, a lot of passion there, and a lot of, uh, ways that you can help people in that mm. arena. And so lifestyle is a pretty fun one to look at. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and again, it goes back to what I love about this industry. Sky's the limit. Uh, you know, I mentioned golf, gated golf course community. Well, that's a, that's a different kind of lifestyle. People want to be on the golf course and they want to have an open backyard where they can see people playing. And I mean, that's a, a different kind of lifestyle than someone who wants a, you know, some land with, with a home and some acreage so they can put the horses up. I mean, those are two vastly different lifestyles that people are after. And if you can connect to those lifestyle, then the more apt you are to have business coming from that type of clientele. Yeah. 
just so important. Now, I do want to tell the audience that we will dive into a part two of this, which is about creating a plan around uh, asking questions like, what are my ideal clients challenges or pain points, but mm. that is in the next podcast. So if you feel like, oh my gosh, you're missing the big picture of this Amber. No, we're not. We're taking you on a journey. It was too much for one podcast. Um, separate it out. If we got to separate it out. Uh, now Jason's going to take us through once we ask these questions now, what does, does it help us to do during this first part, this first well, nine questions that we've just taken them through? So when you take the time to answer these questions and, and you've done it, you know, carefully, you've done it thoughtfully, then you should have a very clear idea or vision of who your ideal client avatar is. And so again, go through those nine questions that we gave you, make sure that you just answer them to the fullest. And, and like my queen was saying, go through and figure out what is the common things that these, these answers have in common. And so you're going to have this person in front of you and you should have this person in front of you. I'm talking typed out, you know, in front of you, wherever your business plan is, this is part of that business plan. So this avatar, when all these key words that you've created uh, and even finding a picture of someone that kind of looks like this ideal avatar, that is something that you want to have in front of you at all times, just like a business plan. Okay. And so out of sight, out of mind, right? And so in order to really make this powerful and what you're about to talk about, I got to know who this person is. No, totally. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And then, so and once then they you... have this person there in front of them, maybe even a photo with some traits, maybe this is something on a board. A lot of you create vision boards. Um, and I don't really have a vision board. We have very clear goals in writing though. And part of that is, but if you are into having it vision right in front of you, then that also should be your ideal client avatar because what you focus on expands and you want to start focusing in on that ideal client avatar. Yeah. Now here's, here's where it gets awesome because you've gone through here's the list. good part. Here's the good, here's that good, good. Here's that good part. Here's that good, good. You've gone through this whole list trying to figure out who your ideal avatar is and how to market to them. But here's where the rubber hits the road. This is where the work starts to really come through on your end. So you need to ask yourself these two important questions, all right? Question number one, am I someone that will attract this ideal client? Okay, am Ooh. I, that's, that's where, you're, wow. and all I imagine is people like, like figuring out their ideal client. Yes, that's my ideal client. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be business. And then you've got to ask a very hard question, which is, am I the, am I someone that will attract this ideal client? And if I'm not, then who do I need to become to attract this ideal client? Now, this is not about becoming someone that you're not, someone that right. you're innately just not. Okay. Right. I, I, I don't play golf. I have, I have no desire. I don't understand it. You know, I just, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a social person, but if that's my ideal client avatar, if that's what I am truly wanting. Okay. If I if that's what I said, I love it. I, I want these people. They're great to work with. I had a couple of transactions and, and they just went great for me. I went through all those questions and my ideal client is a golf course gated community person then I really have to say, who do I need to become to attract? I, I would need to start understanding golf. I would have to learn it. I would have to go to those places. I would have to be more extroverted than I naturally am. If I'm willing to do that, if I'm not, then I can't have that ideal client avatar because you're never, it's, it will always be a forced, uh, a forced personality on you you're not going to have that much interest. Therefore, you're not going to create the content or the marketing pieces that you'll need to make to attract those people anyway. Or if you do, yeah. it'll be a massive chore and a drain on your energy. Yeah, because if your vibe attracts your tribe, well, then who do you need to become to attract that person? And that is just uh, such a good preach moment right there that a lot of that. us not are that. not thinking about. All right, that was question number one. What is question number two? The second, the second question, once you've figured out who your ideal client avatar is, are the activities that I'm doing attracting my ideal client? Am I building my list with this client? 
You know, um, every piece of content that you put out, once you understand who your ideal client, every piece of content, every ad, every listing presentation, it needs to speak to that ideal client. So what are the activities? Activities in, in, in my head is going to be about posting content, you know, in general. Um, but even where you're hanging that, out, even where even you're hanging, hanging out, out yeah. is where I'm networking today, attracting my ideal client is the partnerships and vendor relationships I'm making today, working with my ideal client, like just every decision you ever make, like you even said earlier, I'm at a real estate convention and this person talking to me about a new service. That's cool, but does it attract my exactly. ideal client? So it applies to all this stuff in number two. And, what, and I would go even further. It's like, where, where am I buying my coffee? Where am I stopping for lunch? Every opportunity that you have, where am I getting gas? You know, where do I get my dry cleaning done? Where am I going to get my car serviced at? All of these actions and, and decisions that you make is an opportunity for you to start to become that ideal client magnet. But if, again, if it's not, if the activities are not, then, then there, we shouldn't be shocked that we're not attracting the people that we want if we're not doing the activities we need to be doing. Yeah. And we're talking about your everyday activities and we, we preach every day, your sphere list has to grow. If your sphere yeah. list doesn't grow, then neither does your business. But the things you're doing to grow your sphere list should be with your ideal client and your daily activities. Yeah. That is so good. So, so good. So good. Right. All right, you guys, th that's a lot that we've given you to think about today. Now, defining your ideal client avatar isn't just an exercise. It's a strategic shift that is going to set you apart. It's going to help you to enjoy your work more. And ultimately, it's going to drive your success. So we want you to start this today and watch how it transforms your business. And if you've already done an ideal client avatar, you want to look at it every year when you're redoing your goals, make it part of your goal planning to make sure that nothing has changed. And once you've established your ideal client avatar, step two is going to be to create your USP or your unique selling proposition, or some people call it a UVP, a unique value proposition. And we're gonna be doing that in the very next episode, uh, but we can't really talk about that when you don't have this established yet, all right? So that's gonna be in the next episode. So step one was create your ideal client avatar first. But if you need help generating continuous closings without paying for leads, all you have to do is give us a shout, contact us. We're helping agents all over the country to become the default choice for referrals so they can live a life of joy and prosperity. All right, guys, that is all we have for you today. Now, if you like what you heard, remember that you can uh, subscribe to the podcast, listen to future episodes, and uh, share with a friend today. And remember that God has given you everything you need to succeed. All you have to do is take daily imperfect action. We'll see you next time.